Hello and good morning friends. Welcome to CEC Live sessions dear friends as always today we are going to talk on a very important topic and we would be discussing on Coleridge as critic and for this discussion we have once again with us in our studios professor Bhim Singh Dahiya professor Bhim Singh Dahiya is a renowned professor of English he has contributed a lot in the area of academics and he is continuously giving and sharing information as well as knowledge with the students so friends, we would like to welcome our guest Professor Beam Singh Dahiya and uh, today we are going to talk on uh, Coleridge as a critic. Uh, friends, if you want to ask questions from Professor Beam Singh Dahiya, then you can call straight in the CEC studios. Kindly note down our toll free number through which you can uh, ask questions on today's topic from uh, Professor Dahiya. It is 1-800-110-430. 1 I repeat, our number is 1-800-110-430. Friends, you are requested to call in the last 10 minutes of the lecture so that you could have a deep insight into today's topic uh, from Professor Bhim Singh Dahiya. And uh, afterwards, in the last 10 minutes, we promise to give answers to your questions. Hello, sir. Welcome to the lecture. Thank you. Well, uh, it is natural to talk about Coleridge after Wordsworth. Both were not only contemporaries, they were friends and collaborators. The year of birth of Coleridge was 1772 and he died in 1834. During this period, he did a lot of work, including writing poetry, writing uh, criticism, and then writing philosophic books. In his friendship with uh, Wordsworth, he wrote poems. The most important one you must have heard of or maybe read the ancient mariner and Christabel. These were the two important poems that he wrote, besides many more. But he is best known by these two poems. He also wrote Ode to Dejection. But his poetry came in the earliest phase of his career, whereas criticism and philosophy followed. The background to his philosophy is that he visited Germany and lived there for some time. During that period of his stay in Germany for a year or two, he came into contact with the German philosophers, philosophers of the Romantic age at that time, like Schlegel. Schlegel brothers were well known. He came into contact with them and exchanged his ideas on life, on literature, and particularly on poetry and criticism. Before Coleridge, criticism was classical, then neoclassical, always swearing by the ancient classics like Aristotle or Horace. The language also in the neoclassical age was what they used to call poetic diction. Means not the ordinary language that people speak in everyday life, but a class apart, a different sort of language which is chosen one, which is elitist and very different from the common speech. 
Now, Wordsworth and Coleridge revolted against this. They rejected the neoclassical poetic diction and they said, for whom are we writing? Are we writing for ourselves? That we must have a special language of our own? Literature is primarily for the people. They are the readers. Common people are the readers of literature, not the specialists. So they adopted the common language of the people. Every day use language and adopted it in their poems, in their poetry. That's why when you read their poems, they are immediately available to us, comprehensible to us, because they are in the language that we ourselves use. And not only the language, they also decided to write upon common subjects of life, everyday life. Whereas Dryden and Pope, they used to write about the elitist life. Ladies in club, princes, warriors, people who were chosen ones in society. <clears throat> the eye up so-called. And they wouldn't write about the common people. So Wordsworth and Coleridge raised a banner of revolt against all this tradition. And they said poetry and literature in general must be for the people and therefore in the language of the people and about the life of the people. So that was a great revolution in literature, in the history of English literature. And these two persons, poets, also theorists, and uh, Coleridge also critic. Wordsworth was a poet and a theorist. Coleridge was a poet and a theorist and a critic. So he was three in one, Wordsworth was two in one. And in his criticism, he didn't spare even Wordsworth. He finds fault with his, with his poems, with his language, with his uh, choice of subject matter, so on and so forth. Well, this may be personal, but there is certain amount of objectivity also. Coleridge knew what he was doing and therefore professionally he must observe the ethics of his profession that is a critic who must be objective, who must view things and judge them on their merit, not because they were written by so and so. The person does not matter whether you have intimate relations or inimical relations with him. What matters is the quality of poetry that he has produced. So Coleridge did that. Now the major contribution of Coleridge to criticism is particularly romantic criticism that he introduced two new words in literary criticism, imagination and fancy. Before Coleridge, these terms were interchangeable. You could use either. In a way, there was confusion about them. Imagination, fancy, fancy, imagination. Coleridge said, no, these are two different 
different abilities of mind, qualities of mind, and they must be defined and distinguished and discriminated from each other. So let's see how he defines them. Imagination, he says, the imagination I consider either as primary or secondary. Imagination also is not just one blanket term for Coleridge. He says, imagination are also of two types. The types are primary imagination and secondary imagination. Blanket term imagination is not enough. You must be able to discriminate and distinguish between different kinds of imagination. So broadly, he divides imagination into two categories. First, the primary imagination. Second, the secondary imagination. The primary imagination Coleridge defines, I hold to be the living power and prime agent of all human perception. And as a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. By the way, this I am is under the influence of Indian thought, or call it Hindu thought. Because these Germans had the advantage of having read the Hindu scriptures. Our uh, Ved Shastras, particularly Vivekananda. and Tagore, such other writers, Tagore comes later. These, you see, early 19th century writing and our ancient writing, they had read the ancient writing of Hindu philosophy and they were influenced by it. So that is why Coleridge is talking of I am he says, the primary imagination is like the godlike faculty of creation. Just as God has created the universe, so man also has godlike quality of creativity. He can create, like God, new things and newer things. So that is primary imagination. Secondary imagination is limited, that is imitative. It is imitative of the primary imagination. Whatever the primary imagination has created, the models of that creation, they uh, get reproduced by the secondary imagination. Just like a great artist and the secondary artists. Shakespeare, and before him, Homer, writing epic, Sophocles, writing tragedies. Now, these were later copied. Epic poem was copied by later poets, and drama was copied by later dramatists. After Sophocles, you have Euripides. You have Aeschylus. These were the Greeks. Then come the Romans. Then come the other Europeans, French, German, then English, Italian, so on and so forth. But the primary texts, products of primary imagination, were by these founders, the Greeks. So this is what Coleridge is talking about, 
what is primary imagination and what is secondary imagination. Primary imagination, he says, is God-like quality. I am. I repeat the definition again. The imagination then I consider either as primary or secondary. The primary imagination I hold to be the living power and prime agent of all human perception. And as a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. So God-like quality. He says in the finite, because man is mortal. This God-like create, uh, creativity exists within the finite mortal mind. The secondary imagination I consider as an echo of the former, coexisting with the conscious will, yet still as identical with the primary in the kind of its agency and differing only in degree and in the mode of its operation. Which simply means that primary imagination is creative. It is an act of creation and it expresses itself through inspiration. That's why, see, poets invoke the goddess of poetry. And through that inspiration, inspiration from the goddess of poetry, they write. In other words, they want to say that what I am writing is actually not my writing as a mortal human being. I am writing it through inspiration. And when I am an inspired bard, then it is the supernatural power which is writing through me. It is the goddess of poetry writing. So this was the conventional, traditional belief with the poets, that great poets are inspired. And inspiration means that through them, it is the supernatural powers which are giving expression to ideas about life, ideas, emotions, and so on. Secondary imagination is an imitation of the primary. It has no direct contact with the supernatural power, the goddess. It only imitates the primary, the product of the primary imagination. So that becomes secondary imagination, primary and secondary. Now, Coleridge greatly believed in the supernatural. Wordsworth didn't. Wordsworth wrote about common people, wrote in the language of the common people, and believed that all the reality there is, is in the human world. What we do, what we feel. Of course, one big difference between the earlier poetry, that is neoclassical, and the romantic poetry is that while the neoclassical poetry was the poetry of ideas, poetry of wit, poetry of criticism, romantic poetry is poetry of emotion how you feel, what you feel. So it is feelings and emotions, your aspirations, which are expressed in your poems. 
That's why here there is greater emphasis on imagination. During the Romantic era, imagination replaced wit. Earlier poetry was witty, entirely relying on wit. That's why a certain smartness, a certain uncommonness, different from the common speech, common behavior, that was neoclassical poetry. From Dryden to Pope to Johnson, you have this display of wit. But the moment Wordsworth comes and Coleridge comes, they revolutionize, revolutionize the literature in English and they romanticize it. They replace wit by imagination. They replace the idea by feeling. So from the mind, it comes down to the heart. So it's the poetry of the heart, whereas neoclassical poetry was the poetry of the mind, of thought, of ideas, including your preferences and prejudices. But the romantics believed that emotion is more universal. Feelings are universal. Everybody, big and small, high and low, they are humans basically. And as humans, they have the common feelings and emotions of love, of hatred, of friendship, of jealousy. All these positive, negative feelings they are common to all. So they thought, why not write poetry which is available to everybody, which will appeal to all, whereas the neoclassical poetry was only for a few. It was elitist. It was only for the elites, highly educated, highly sophisticated, and it became a kind of code language and code mannerism to, to use that language and to speak in it, to express yourself. So Wordsworth and Coleridge reacted against it and brought poetry back to the fundamentals, to the universals, to the primary emotions and feelings of mankind irrespective of their status, of their rank, of their position in society or wherever. So this was a great revolution they brought about. Now Coleridge further defines uh, imagination as primary and, and secondary. Let us see what he says. He says, Primary imagination, which makes ordered perception of objective reality possible. It's a unification of sense impressions into an organic pattern. So primary imagination can relate an object to another and a part to the whole. So this quality he attributes to the primary imagination. That it is a part of your mind, which means a higher part of your thought, of your thinking. That you can relate one thing with another and everything to the whole, a complete whole, because after all, things are related to each other. But to be able to perceive that, to, able to, to be able to see that, and to be able to 
imagine the whole through those parts. That is the task of primary imagination, which Coleridge says the poet has. Common reader would not have. Common reader would see it only after the poet has shown it to him. On his own, he does not have that ability, that quality of mind. Then secondary imagination. The secondary imagination is akin to the primary, in so far as both are vital and perform the common function of creating order out of the confusion of sense impressions. He says to an extent, secondary imagination does the same job as primary imagination does, but only partly. The first step of the primary imagination is done by the secondary imagination also. But it cannot do the entire job of the primary imagination. That is why it is secondary. The primary imagination can relate one thing to another and can relate everything to the whole, which secondary imagination partly does but can't entirely do. The essential difference between the two lies in the fact that the secondary imagination does not work involuntarily, but is dependent on human will. So when you are inspired and you are doing the task of the primary imagination, then you are beyond your and above your common faculties of mind and heart because you are inspired. So you are in a superior state of mind where you rise above all this. But then secondary imagination follows. The lower things, the minor things, the incomplete things, the details, they are taken up by the secondary imagination. They will be taken care of by the secondary. That is why the complete, the whole of the poem comes out from the collaboration of the two, the primary and the secondary. Yes, sir. Okay, then. Uh, uh, we break. Thank you very much. And we will resume very soon. So we would like to thank Professor Bhim Singh Dahiya for uh, giving us a vivacious uh, uh, session on uh, Coleridge as critic. As he himself said that we are going to continue further. So dear friends, we are going to take a small break over here. And we would be meeting and discussing more on Coleridge as critic. Bonnie. <laughs> Thank you.
Hello yeah. friends, uh, welcome to the CEC Live Lectures. Friends, as you know that we are talking on Coleridge as critic and we have with us in our studios uh, Professor Bheem Singh Dahiya, a renowned professor of English who is appreciated worldwide. So I would like to uh, welcome Professor Bheem Singh Dahiya once again and uh, sir, I request you to continue further. Okay, to continue our story of Coleridge as critic, uh, we were talking about his contribution to literary criticism, particularly the English. And his contribution is that he gave two new terms. So he added to the critical terminology. He, was, he had the advantage of being a poet. He also had the advantage of being a philosopher. And... Uh, these two qualities combined gave him an advantage, an edge over other simple poets like Wordsworth, because Wordsworth was a poet alone. Of course, he theorizes his preface to lyrical ballads was a piece of theory, theory about what is poetry. But he could only theorize about what he was doing what he knew. Coleridge had a wider field of knowledge. He was well read in the romantic philosophers of Germany. And that advantage gave him an edge over Wordsworth. But then you can't be uh, as great in both. Either you are a greater poet and lesser critic, like Wordsworth was, or you are a greater critic and a lesser poet, as Coleridge was. So the two are complementary. They can't be equal. So one has to be greater than the other. It all depends upon which faculty, creative or critical, is stronger in you, is superior in you, is higher in you. So in Wordsworth, the poetic uh, faculty, the creative faculty was stronger and higher. In Coleridge, it was the critical faculty which was stronger and higher. So that is the difference, although both were both poets and critics. So we were uh, describing the primary and secondary imagination and Coleridge explained how primary imagination is like the godlike, it's like uh, the God's creation, I am. So man inspired, the poet inspired into a supernatural being becomes godlike. So that is the task, he says, of primary imagination. The secondary imagination is only imitative. When you come down on earth, no longer in the ecstatic state of inspiration, then you try to recall things from the past and then imitate them. Now that, he says, is the task of secondary imagination. <clears throat> So the function of imagination is displayed in seeing all things as one and one in all things. So this is not Coleridge's jugglery. It has a point. And the point is that nothing is absolute. He means to say that the part and the whole are interlinked with each other. They are related to each other. And they have the qualities of each other. Essence. The essentials are common to them. It is merely the difference of quantity or of degree. So degree and quantity. In other words, quality and quantity. Both in certain measure would make it primary 
and both in lower measure will make it secondary. That is the difference. That's why Coleridge plays upon one and many and many and one. One means every part is present in all other parts. And the essence of all other parts is present in every one, each part. The analogy that he has in mind is of God's creation. He says humanity is God's creation. And in every human, there is this spark of God. This is Indian philosophy, or call it Hindu philosophy. And this is what the Germans learned from the Indians. That there is God within in every human. You only need to realize it. Common men do not realize it. They remain busy doing mundane things of life. Eating, drinking, sleeping, and so on. Playing. But those who want to reach the divine in them, then they become, as is generally said, sannyasis. They become spiritual people. They abandon the material pursuits and take to spiritualism. And there they realize the inner self, the absolute self. So one in many and many in, in one, that is what Coleridge plays upon in defining the primary imagination and secondary imagination. So the function of imagination is displayed in seeing all things as one and one in all things. So the relationship between the part and the whole, it works by bringing about the balance or reconciliation of opposite or discordant qualities. The discordant qualities as given by Coleridge are a sense of novelty and freshness with old and familiar objects. Second, a more than usual state of emotion with more than usual order. Third, to make the external internal, the internal external, to make nature thought and thought nature. And fourth, sameness with difference, truth in observing with the imaginative faculty in modifying the object observed, reducing multitude to unity or succession to an instant. So six qualities or six functions, the ways in which imagination operates it works upon the object. Like a poet chooses any object to write a poem about. It may be a tree. It may be a beggar. It may be a child. It may be an old man. Then he thinks, he visualizes of the entirety of that object and the parts and then relate the parts to the whole and whole to the parts. Because only then can you get at the complete truth about any object or person, living or non-living. Only by First, dividing the whole into parts and then relating the parts to the whole. Because nothing is without parts and everything is in wholeness. It's a great philosophic question that Coleridge is raising. 
For example, in the case of a poet, first of all, his entire work, since it is by one poet, act of creation of one mind and heart. So each poem can be related to the whole. That's why we speak of the complete work of Wordsworth or complete work of Coleridge. So every poem can be related to the complete, to the whole. Shorter poems of Wordsworth can be related to his longer poem, The Prelude. Shorter poems of Coleridge can be related to his longer poems like The Ancient Mariner. So part to the whole and whole to the part, one can see that and one must see that. Unless you are able to do that exercise, you will not be able to see the whole truth. Because the whole truth is in the, in the entire product. It is not in one piece. So neither the overview nor the individual view is sufficient by itself. They become sufficient only after you relate them to each other. It's a great thing that and great philosophic truth that Coleridge has brought to our notice. Then he defines fancy. Fancy on the contrary, he says. Contrary means to the opposite. So, there is such a big difference that they are opposite to each other. Fancy on the opposite has no other counters to play with, but fixities and definities. Imagination is creative. It creates new things. The poet has that ability. Fancy is a lower operation of the mind. It can, cannot create anything new. It only plays upon what is there in the material world. What is visible, not what is invisible. Spiritual world is invisible. But material world is visible. So prime, the, the imagination plays with or works upon, acts upon, recreates the spiritual world. Whereas fancy deals with the material reality, the practical human life. In other words, Coleridge has in mind the difference between the romantic and the classical or neoclassical. Because immediately before the Romantics, there were the newer classical poets, Pope and Johnson. So he says the difference between the two is that Pope and Johnson or the new classical poetry deals with what is available in the concrete, the material world. So the subject of neoclassical poetry is the material world. It's a work of fancy. That's why you have poetry of wit. Whereas romantic poetry, he says, does not deal with the mundane things of life. Does not deal with the material world. It deals with the spiritual world, which is common to all. It is not a matter of fashion. It is not a matter of 
elite practice like uh, the clubs, coffee houses, because in neoclassical poetry, Pope, for example, doesn't see it. Or the rape of the lock. The material that he is handling is uh, the life of clubs and coffee houses, fashionable people wearing new and newer dresses every day and going for new and newer tastes in coffee or in drinks. For the romantics, this is not the universal subject of poetry because the activities covered by it are not universal. Whereas primary emotions and feelings, for example, of love, of death, these are common to all. You may be very high, you may be very low. Common people love as well as high people do. They mourn death high as well as low. So he says, this is the true area of the uh, of poetry universal universality permanent things not the passing things of life going on he further comes to define he's a great definer of things because he's a philosopher and he's a critic. So philosopher always goes to the source of the object, to the primary nature of everything. For example, if you say poetry, you will say, what is poetry? If you say catharsis, you will say, what is catharsis? If you say emotion, he says, what is emotion? In other words, to know the object is the primary concern and the main concern of the philosopher. He would not proceed unless he knows the first step, because he will take the second step only when the first is known to him, and gradually he will reach the whole. And in that process, each part gets related to the whole. And the whole encompasses each part and every part. That is the difference between Coleridge and Wordsworth. Wordsworth could not accomplish all this because he was a poet. And whatever little theorization he did, was based upon his own poetry. Whereas Coleridge is a philosopher, is a thinker. So it is not merely his kind of poetry that he is theorizing about. He is theorizing about poetry as such, as it essentially is. Then he comes to define what is a poem. He wouldn't proceed further, unless he has made it clear what he means by poetry and what he means by a poem. A poem, he says, is that species of composition which is opposed to the works of science. By proposing for its immediate object, pleasure, not truth. So he is defining poetry by contrast because what it is not is also important. First you must know what poetry is not. Then he will come to what poetry is. So he says poetry is not science because the objects they deal with, 
and the purposes they have in as as a target are very different are opposed to each other for example he says the purpose of science is truth a scientist wants to reach the truth of everything what is a table what is a chair four legs and a top makes it table but it is also a chair if it gets a back and arms so arms and back added to table becomes chair it is this kind of thing that coleridge is doing he is defining what poetry is now he would define what poem is a poem is that species of composition which is opposed to the works of science by proposing for its immediate object pleasure not truth so he says the object of science is truth it aims at truth it strives for truth it tries to reach the truth the purpose of poetry is pleasure it gives you pleasure when you read a poem when you see a flower when you see a river flowing you you derive pleasure out of it so poetry deals with this and it provides pleasure to the viewer to the reader science gives you truth so we have to stop you over here because okay. we have a caller thank right you very now. much yeah. we have a caller hello hello you yeah, are most welcome hello ma'am yes hello please tell your name and ask a question hello 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 ma'am i have a request yes yes kindly tell your request ma'am my request is that please organize lecture on history a uh, friend you can see lectures on history uh, from 2 to 3 we organize lectures in between 2 to 3 and if you want to access lectures on history then all the lectures uh, pertaining to the various series are there on the youtube so friend uh, you can just log on www.youtube.com/ccsat i have a question also yes please madam coleridge as a critic uh, how much he successful and reform Uh, you just want to know uh, what reformation uh, he brought through his poetry yes sir he just wanted to know that uh, how coleridge and to what extent he brought reformation through the poetry coleridge well we don't call poets as reformers but every poet has something new to say like wordsworth spoke about the common feelings emotions practices of life coleridge spoke of uncommon for example his the ancient mariner the supernatural the bird that comes on the ship and the mysteriousness surrounding it the ancient mariner goes through experiences which are uncommon which are not common so coleridge deals with uncommon things of life and he wants to show that whatever wordsworth is saying he is saying about the common things of life but there is another aspect to life of course it may not be common that's why it is uncommon and it is rare it not happens all the time to everybody but there are things in life which you may not see which you may not feel every day or commonly but then there are times when unique things happen exceptional things happen unforeseen things happen and you are astounded by god what is this for example in hamlet shakespeare's somebody tells hamlet 
that he saw the ghost of his father. Horatio tells him. He gets curious. He says, oh, I shall like to see him. Then Horatio takes him along. First it were the watchmen who had seen that. Then Horatio. And then Hamlet. And Hamlet says, Horatio, thou art scholar. Why don't you speak to the ghost? Ask questions, so on and so forth. So Coleridge dealt with this area of life. Uncommon, unforeseen, things happening uniquely and you are caught by surprise. I hope your question is answered. If not, we are available for further discussion. Yes, dear friend, we believe that you might have got answer of your question mm -hmm. and uh, keep calling us and keep writing us too. If you have any queries, then do write to us at info.cc at nic.in. Definitely, we'll try to give answers to your questions when next time uh, Professor Bhim Singh Dahiya visits our studio. So, we have few minutes left uh, with us, so we would uh, like to conclude today's session. So, in your words, if you want to uh, describe Coleridge as a critic. Well, Coleridge's contribution to criticism, to English criticism, is that he added the dimension of philosophy to it. Before him, right from Sydney through Dryden to Pope and to Johnson, there was heavy reliance upon what the ancients had said what Plato and Aristotle had said, what Horace had said. So they were only explaining that. They were only repeating that. So they were tradition bound. They were traditionalists. Now the Romantics did one thing, they broke new ground. They paved the way for new thinking fresh thinking, because truth is not limited and truth is not fixed. Truth keeps unfolding itself. Well, there was a time when Bullock Art was only convenience. Now you have supersonics. Man can fly to the moon. I have the good luck of having had the first man on the moon as my colleague at the University of Cincinnati in America. He was in the aerospace department. So, through experience, you get to know. Definitely, and through Professor Bhim Singh Dahiya, we get to know each uh, single and uh, big bit together. Friends, if you have any queries, then do write to us at info.cc at nic.in. And we know that you are curious uh, that uh, how you could uh, have uh, sessions on various subjects. We try to conduct sessions on various subjects through live uh, sessions as well as um, the sessions which are uh, live for you are recorded simultaneously. If you want to see the recorded sessions, then we would uh, like to share that uh, we have a YouTube channel channel where we share uh, and upload the lectures on uh, various subjects as well as there are various series under different subjects. So just log on to www.youtube.com slash CEC Adiset. This is the YouTube channel of uh, CC where you can uh, get the ample of series on uh, various subjects. Friends, we would be meeting again soon and would be continuing further with our series. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very much. Yeah.